Uh, welcome everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Today we present big data guru, named guru, uh, Vice President of Cognitive Computing at IBM Research, Guru Banavar. Uh, fitting with our series theme this season, uh, data comprises the threads of our enormous loom created by the information age. Uh, from government systems to healthcare, education, scientific research, and the media, to the frontier of artificial intelligence, uh, the capacity for data to create is still very much as yet unrealized. And I think that uh, I think you will find that Guru is one of the world's sharpest minds in devising uh, the architecture and applications it affords. I looked high and low for a good speaker on artificial intelligence, and I think you're going to like him. Uh, and coincidentally, it was reported today in the New York Times, if anyone saw it, the ancient board game of Go, which has long remained a human conquest, thought to require too much complex strategy uh, and intuition to be bested by a computer. Uh, but in a major breakthrough on Tuesday evening, a Google computer named AlphaGo beat the world champion, South Korea's Lee si dole So does this mean computers are gaining on humans? Something to think about. Uh, I do want to thank our partners for their support of today's program, the School of Information and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. A uh, couple of things to do announcements so that you know. Tomorrow, opening receptions for MFA thesis shows for our MFA uh, candidates at the Stamp School. Yeah. Good to know they have some supporters in the house. I'm sure they're running, they're not here and they're very stressed out. Uh, this will be a staggered event of three, in three, three openings, beginning at the Slusser Gallery at the Stamp School at 4.30, moving to the Work Gallery up on State Street at 6 o'clock, and then the Argus II Building on 4th Street at 7.30. So take it all in uh, on Friday evening. And just as spring has come early this year, uh, and not to forget daylight savings is coming spring forward on Sunday, we will have the earliest spring equinox any of us here have ever had in our lives, apparently according to calendars. Uh, a great Ann Arbor tradition returns early next week. Do not miss the opening of the 54th Ann Arbor Film Festival, which opens right here at the Michigan Theater next Tuesday night, March 15th. Uh, this is the longest running independent and experimental film festival in North America, right here in Ann Arbor. And it is probably the biggest gathering of visual artists from around the world that takes place in a year in Ann Arbor. So not to be missed, get your tickets, get passes. I left pamphlets at the front when you were walking in. If you didn't get one, there are some on the table as you'll be walking out because it's an intense schedule. And just wanted to point out, I forgot to bring it up here, but if you open that pamphlet up, there's a big poster on the inside inside, and that poster was created by a stamp school student, Alicia Wessler. So, go stamps. Uh, we will have our regular Q&A today directly following this talk, and for those of you who are here, computer scientists who have never been to a penny stamps before, this means that after Guru finishes his talk up here, you can exit the theater, go left, go down the hallway, you will find there is another little lobby and there's another theater called the screening room, and that's where we will convene directly after the talk to uh, ask Guru's questions. Um, so please do remember to turn off cell phones. Uh, and uh, before we get too far ahead, I wanted to make sure you all know uh, you, the University of Michigan and IBM uh, are in collaboration together in an effort to help solve one of the grand challenges of artificial intelligence. U of M and IBM have launched a four and a half million dollar collaboration to develop a new class of conversational technologies that will enable people to interact more naturally and effectively with computers. This project is named Sapphire. Uh, and uh, the U of M Artificial Intelligence Lab is working on this here at U of M, and they will develop a cognitive system that functions, functions as an academic advisor uh, for undergraduate computer science uh, engineers and majors that are working on this. I hope you're here in the audience today. Uh, it's very cool. We'll see. Uh, and now for a proper introduction of our guest today, we just happen to have none other than IBM's collaborating partner on the Project Sapphire. Please welcome Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Director of the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at the University of Michigan, Satinder Singh.
Thank you all. Um, I'll take a minute to describe um, uh, all the excitement about AI, just to find AI for a minute and then introduce the speaker. So um, those of us who work in artificial intelligence or AI as it's called, um, are interested in creating artificial minds. Um, now with our minds, with human minds, we do many things. We, we see, we hear, we come to understand the world, uh, we act in the world, uh, we plan ahead, we make games, we play games, and so on. And um, AI has succeeded in creating computer programs that exhibit uh, many of the aspects of intelligence I just mentioned. But the reason why I'm saying all this is because creativity in art and design, uh, while there has been some progress in AI, I think remains one of the um, open challenges uh, for AI. So today, with that uh, brief uh, thoughts about AI, it's my pleasure to, and honor to introduce a, a leader in AI from the company that gave us the chess playing program that beat Gary, Gary Kasparov, uh, the world chess champion, uh, a couple of decades ago at Deep Blue, and also uh, gave us the very impressive Watson system uh, more recently. I imagine we'll hear a lot about Watson uh, from the speaker, so I won't go much further into that. So our speaker today is uh, Dr. Gurudath Banavar, or Guru as he's known. Guru is the vice president of cognitive computing, as Christina mentioned, at IBM Research. Uh, responsible for the next generation of AI systems that learn, reason, and interact uh, with people. He's worked on uh, lots of projects within IBM, including the projects on making uh, smarter cities by building the City Operations Center in Rio de Janeiro. He's an elected member of the IBM Academy of Technology. His work has been featured in uh, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, lots of international media, and so on. And uh, while he was uh, uh, head of IBM research in India, helped develop a spoken web project to give access to people uh, through, the, through spoken language to the web in India and received a 2009 National Innovation Award by the President of India for that project. So with that, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Guru. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, uh, Satinder and uh, Christina for a lovely introduction. It's, it's great to be here in a beautiful theater uh, here in Ann Arbor. Um, you know, as I uh, stand in front of you today, I am reminded of um, a long history of uh, work uh, that I have done in AI and, and many others of my colleagues. In fact, Satinder is one of the leaders in this area, and some of my colleagues are also in the audience um, who I will re reference as I go through some of the examples that I'm going to show you today. But 25 years ago, um, I had built a, you know, what we used to call expert systems. And uh, my father, who is a judge in India, asked me to help him with automotive compensation cases. And I actually created a system for him that would go through some of the case law in automotive compensation and give him some suggestions about what to do in a specific scenario. And that was, I think it was really a toy system because it was obviously you know, not fed with all of the case law. It did not have all of the machinery underneath it to work on the complex area of automotive compensation. Um, back then, we had a dream. We thought that uh, you know, these systems can actually support professionals like my father to do better in their jobs. But we did not have all the technologies back then. Today we do, 25 years later. We have a huge amount of data. We have a huge number of new technologies, algorithms, and computer hardware through which we believe we can make some of those breakthroughs that we dreamt of uh, 25 years ago. And um, today in my talk, I want to give you some examples of uh, what we are doing with these systems. And I believe that these systems are actually changing our world. They're really, truly transforming. We call them cognitive systems. And the general area of cognitive systems is what we call cognitive computing. I'm going to tell you what that is. But before I go into cognitive computing, I, you know, given the, the latest news about uh, the Go game, uh, that was mentioned earlier. I want to tell you that IBM has been doing a lot of games for a number of years. You know, back in the year 1956, 
some of my colleagues back then in, in, um, in IBM tried the game of checkers. And about uh, in the year of about 1994, my colleague Jerry Tesaro, who is here in the audience, and he's also known as the father of deep reinforcement learning, because that work that he did back then in 1994 has actually been used in the Go system that is beating the world champion today. And most of the people who work in the reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning area acknowledge that Jerry was one of the founders of this area back in the year 1994 when he started working on something he called TD Gammon. It's a, it's a backgammon game that, that could learn by looking at a number of examples of these kinds of games. Um, in 1997, another of my colleagues, Murray Campbell, uh, was part of the team that built a computer called Deep Blue, which uh, is very famous, as you all probably know about. And it beat the world champion in chess, Gary Kasparov. Um, and that has been a landmark in uh, the field of artificial intelligence. Um, all of these systems used games which are very well defined. They are contained, they have rules, they have a very uh, you know, closed or a well-articulated set of rules. And that makes it, of course, a great experimental laboratory for trying out beautiful new algorithms and technologies. But the real world is very complicated. The real world has something we all use every day, which is natural language, English, which has a lot of ambiguities, uh, nuances, um, puns, puzzles even sometimes. You know, we don't necessarily say what we mean. Um, and it's very complicated to understand natural language. So these games, while they were big advances in the field, getting to natural language understanding was always considered a major, major challenge until 2011, when a computer from IBM, which we've named Watson, was able to compete in another, call it a, an exhibition match, of Jeopardy, which is, a, as you know, it's a question answering system where there are a lot of linguistic features like you know, ambiguity, um, references, puzzles, um, you know, all kinds of maybe uh, metaphors, those kinds of things are very, very complicated. I mean, we find it very easy to understand natural language, but computers find it extremely hard. So for us, Jeopardy was a major step to try and understand how computers can make sense out of natural language. And when we were able to build a system that could understand these complicated questions, which are actually posed as answers, and get to the right answers, which should be posed as questions, um, we were, of course, thrilled that we created yet another major landmark in the history of computing. Um, my colleagues in the IBM TJ Watson Research Center um, were, of course, responsible for building that system. And I want to show you a little bit of what was going on behind the scenes when the Jeopardy game happened. You may have seen the actual game or maybe videos of the game, um, as you would see as a, as a television viewer. But what was going on behind the scenes? Watch this. I remember that morning going to the lab, and I was thinking, this is it. This is the last Jeopardy game. This is Jeopardy, the IBM challenge. Here we go. Brad, if you're ready, make your first choice. Let's take alternate meanings for 200, Alex. Four-letter word for a vantage point or a belief. Brad. What is a view? Yes. After the first clue of the game, which Brad won, I had just this horrible feeling at that moment that he was as good as everyone said he was, and he was just going to run the whole board on us. Watson. What is you? You are right. We actually took the lead. We were ahead of them, but then we started getting some questions wrong. Watson. 
What is leg? No, I'm sorry, I can't accept that. What is 1920s? No. What is chic? No, sorry. Brad. What is class? Class, you got it. Watson? What is Sauron? Sauron is right, oh. and that puts you into a tie for the lead with Brad. The double jeopardy round of the first game I thought was phenomenal. Watson went on a tear. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. What is violin? Good. Who is the church lady? Yes. <laughs> Watson. What is narcolepsy? You are right, and with that, you move to $36,681. The risk was, Ken gets a daily double, bets big, gets it right, he's gonna be well ahead, and then with that kind of lead going to Final Jeopardy, if he bets enough, he could end up winning the match. Ken, what's a committee? We gotta find that last daily double. We gotta find that last daily double. It was a crucial moment in the game. There was still a daily double on the board, and it was starting to become uh, pretty clear that it was in the legal ease category. Let's go to legal ease for 1,200. Watson. What is executor? Right. Same category, 1600. Answer, daily double. That was the moment when I knew it's over. The category is 19th century novelists. What Watson wants to do then is preserve the lead, not take a big risk, especially with Final Jeopardy, because just like for humans, Final Jeopardy is hard for Watson. Now we come to Watson, who is Bram Stoker and the wager. Hello, 17,973, and a two-day total of 77,147. I would have thought that technology like this was years away, but it's here now. I have the bruised ego to prove it. My past Jeopardy experiences have been great, but they weren't really weighty with this kind of technological, philosophical importance. I think we saw something important today. Didn't really think very much about the implications until later and say, wow, wait a second, this is history. Of course, this whole project is not ultimately about playing Jeopardy. It's about doing research and deep analytics and a natural language understanding. This is about taking the technology and applying it to solve problems people really care about. We're just so excited about all the things we can do with this. I had thought this is the end. We get there, we're done. And I'm realizing it's just the beginning. Um, so you can see the kind of excitement. Thank you. You know, the, the point of the game was not to build a, uh, a sentient machine that can go off and do whatever it likes, but rather, it was really an experiment to understand how machines and people interact with each other, and how machines can actually understand our world, the world of you know, all of us, which we express through natural language uh, every day. And so that became, you know, this notion of deep question answering became a foundation for many things that we thought we wanted to do at the time, and we have now created many new applications and solutions for. So in fact, Watson, which was, a, which was one system back then, has now become a family of systems, and it's now being adapted to different fields, like medicine, education, you name it, law. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of how Watson has come a long way from answering quiz questions to doing a lot of things that will actually make our world a much better place. But let me just step back again. Why is this so hard? It's because the amount of data that we are creating in the world is just enormous. So if you look at you know, how much data we create, now we get 2.5 quintillion bytes of data, which may, may or may not sound like a lot to you. But if I tell you that 90% of the data was created in the last two years, you can understand how much it's growing. And you can imagine how that's going to look like in the future. And it's not just data. It is also knowledge, as in, how we analyze the world and summarize and conclude major things that we write down using you know, scientific publications or analyst reports or articles, all kinds of things we do, those are also increasing at an exponential rate. 
they are doubling every nine or so years. So the amount of data and knowledge in the world is massive, and it's growing at an exponential rate. So getting these computers to ingest all of this data and understand it and answer questions is a massive task. That's the reason why most of us feel overwhelmed as professionals. If you think about the price of not knowing answers, it's massive. If you think about the environment, we're making wrong decisions about the environment because we don't know answers to very deep questions. If you think about patients, we're making wrong decisions. We're not able to get the right treatment for the right patient because there's just too much data. Doctors are not able to understand all of that data and provide the right kinds of treatment. If you look at education, we're not educating our kids in the right way because there's just so much to understand and impart to kids that we're not able to do so. But if you can imagine a world in which you have cognitive systems like Watson that is able to help each one of us by augmenting our intelligence and helping us do our daily tasks, make the right decisions, discover the right kinds of information, and eventually get the right outcomes that we are all desiring. That's what we call cognitive computing. So cognitive computing is really this notion of augmenting people and our intelligence with things that machines can do a lot better than people. So machines, there, there are certain things that machines can do a lot better. And there are certain things that humans can do a lot better. And we would like that combination to be able to get us answers to the big questions, not just the quiz questions that we saw in the Jeopardy video, but the big questions that we face. Why does cancer exist? Why are there so few women in the field of science? Can we actually do something about global warming? Those are the kinds of questions we really would like to answer with these, with these cognitive systems. And we still are pretty far away into getting the full answers, but we are making a lot of progress. And I want to show you how much progress we've made. So to re-emphasize this point, people and machines have very different strengths. What people consider easy, machines consider hard. And what we consider hard, machines consider easy. Think about mathematics. Think about pattern recognition when you have large numbers of uh, you know, data or different kinds of instances in the world. Think about reasoning statistically over, again, a very large, what we call a, a space of possibilities. Those are all good things for machines to be able to do much better than people can. But there are lots of other things, like Christina said at the very beginning, and Satinder said also, there's many creative things. What are the right questions to ask? What kinds of goals should we set up for ourselves? What are the kinds of values that we should bring in? How do we judge when you have many options? What kinds of values do we apply to judge what the right option is? Or what is common sense? You know, common sense physics, common sense life, common sense social intelligence, all of those kinds of things are uniquely human skill. So my view and our view is that the combination of these different dimensions of intelligence is going to yield the kind of breakthroughs we need to answer those big questions. Hello, Ken Jennings. I haven't seen you since that TV quiz show. Hello, Watson. You can see now? I can recognize people, analyze images, and watch movies. Well, I wrote a few books. I did a speaking tour. I... I've been helping people plan for retirement, and I help doctors identify cancer treatments. Is that all? I've recently learned Japanese. Yeah, I was being sarcastic. I haven't learned sarcasm yet. I can help with that. So sarcasm is not something that I think we want machines to learn. <laughs> but I, I do think we want machines to be able to learn you know, how to help people plan their lives and their finances. And we want machines to be able to learn how to help doctors treat all of those uh, uh, disease conditions that, uh, that we are interested in. So that's the new world. In the last five years, since the Jeopardy game in 2011, and what you just saw Ken Jennings talk about, Watson has done a lot of things. Watson has learned 
how to see. It's not just read, but how to see, meaning recognizing objects through, in pictures. Watson has learned how to make uh, many other kinds of interesting inferences from textual data, such as if you give it a big article, Watson can now pull out the key concepts from that article and give you the, key, the relationships among those key concepts. So you can imagine Watson can help you summarize documents. Watson could look at an email that you're about to write or a, um, maybe a blog that you're about to write and can tell you what is the tone that you're taking. Is it a, you know, a positive tone? Is it an angry tone? Um, that's a sentiment or a, a, you know, a style that you have. So Watson can tell you what your textual um, you know, your writing looks like. Um, so there's many new things that Watson has learned, and I'm going to give you several examples of those. What we've been able to do is to decompose the original Watson system and create these application programming interfaces, APIs, as we call it in our, in, in our computing world, and make those available to the entire world through what we call the Watson Developer Cloud. So there are developers all around the world right now, there's tens of thousands of them, who are using these APIs for building their own application. Some of the examples I gave you are shown over here, not just you know, the question answering one, but the tone analyzer, the personality insights, it can tell you, you know, what is the basic personality type you have if you give it enough words that you've written based on just the kinds of words that you use, the kinds of expressions that you use, and so forth. All of these are essentially building blocks that application programmers can use to build many different kinds of applications. And if you ask me what kinds of applications have people built so far, I just pulled out some of, some of the applications that have been built so far. Um, there's everything from travel applications. Uh, there's an example here of uh, something called Wayblazer, which is, think of it as the next generation of Travelocity, where the system is not only giving you you know, uh, availability of uh, planes and hotels and cars, but it's actually looking at people who look like you, um, look at their maybe opinions, or maybe articles that were published in the newspaper, and understand the language in the newspaper and give you recommendations that are much more personalized and that are much more relevant to what you're trying to do. That's, that's one example. There's retail examples where sales associates can recommend better products for people based upon their interests, based upon their personality type. Um, there's many different dimensions over which retail um, uh, associates can, can help you when you have a lot of options. And it does not have to be a person who's helping you. It can also be a, a question answer or an interaction conversation on a website that can help you navigate large quantities of, um, of products. Um, I can go through all of these or many of these, but uh, I won't have time to do that. So instead of um, going through all of this, I, I want to step back from this. What are we trying to do at the end of the day with all of these applications uh, if you look at it from you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road? What are we trying to do? We are trying to create a partnership between Watson and people that will change the nature of expertise, change the nature of um, you know, how we work on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to get comfortable to use these systems in our daily decision-making processes, regardless of which profession you're in. You could be a healthcare professional or a finance professional, an education professional. You could be a business person. And in each of these cases, you can kind of imagine what your, your day would be like if you had a Watson on your shoulder whispering to you what's the right thing to do or what are the options available for all of the hard decisions that you have to make when there's so much data that you need to understand before you can make those decisions. That's the vision that we're going after. Maybe in, in, uh, in a decade or two, you know, the billions of professionals we have on the planet, maybe each one of those professionals, each one of our individuals who are making these hard decisions will have such a cognitive assistant um, at their disposal. It could be a personal one, it could be a professional one, it could be something you do at work. But that's the big vision that I think will, will change the world. So 
I want to step back now and talk to you a little bit about the next few big breakthroughs that we are shooting for. So this is my job. My job is to um, create the next generation of these systems that we are calling Watson as a, as a brand name, so to speak, because there's a many of these systems that all do different kinds of tasks. And of course, I'm working with you know, hundreds of very, very good, bright people. And we are not only working in, you know, internally within IBM, but also collaborating with um, organizations like the University of Michigan, the, A the AI department that Satinder leads, and other partners of IBM, such as our clients who have the problems that, of course, we want to try to solve. Um, many of these application developers, independent software vendors that I mentioned earlier who are building these applications. We are working with all of them. And I list here many of the skills that are essential for creating this next generation of Watson. Um, and I, I guess, given this audience, I'd like to point you to the, to the middle one over there, the cognitive experience, which is the human-computer interaction, which I consider to be fundamental to cognitive computing, because these systems are not going to be standalone systems. They are systems that are working with people every day. So the systems have to understand what people mean, what their intents are, what their, um, you know, uh, their biases are, in many cases, what their personalities are, and so forth. But at the same time, the people have to understand when to leverage systems like this, uh, for what kinds of jobs, what kind of tasks, I should say. Um, these kinds of systems have to be leveraged. And that comes from this whole field, which includes human-computer interaction, speech and vision, visualization, and what we call affective computing, which is how do you understand the, 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 the emotional state um, and work within that state in order to achieve the final objectives that, that people are uh, intending to achieve, and design. There's a number of design parameters in this, in this space, which you know, I'm not an expert in design. You are, many of you are. And I would assert that there are many design questions in this new world that we need to understand. And when I show you examples, maybe you'll see and you'll recognize what's the design problem that, that we need to solve in order to make this world a reality. So I have here a, uh, a set of words that uh, mean a lot to you know, the researchers in my group. Because each of these capabilities, so to speak, well, I call them core capabilities right in the middle, those capabilities are core areas of artificial intelligence and of computer science, uh, even more broadly. And those core capabilities are now being built on top of very new and special kinds of computing infrastructure um, that I'm not going to go into, but I just want, to, want you to know that there's, there's a whole revolution going on in terms of what kinds of new architectures are needed to support these kinds of applications in the future. Um, what I do want to focus on is at the very top, which is all of the applications that are enabled by these capabilities right in the middle. And of course, I won't have time to talk about all of them, but I do want to pick a few examples from the top just to give you a glimpse of what is coming in the future. And these are all, again, research areas right now. It'll probably take us multiple years to get them out, but um, I think you will appreciate that these are very hard problems, and if we can solve these problems, that it will make a big difference to many of um, these, um, these problem domains that we want to uh, crack, so to speak. So let me start with the first one. We call this debating technologies or argumentation technology. In fact, this area is a brand new area. It's called computational argumentation. And the, the premise is very simple. And I think as, as, as humans, we will understand this very easily. If you can argue any position persuasively, you can be very successful in life, right? Any position you take. It could be a controversial position. Um, you know, as an example, uh, you know, you, you could say, is immigration good for the economy? That's a difficult, maybe controversial position that many people will be on one side of it, other people will be on the other side of it, but every person who tries to argue either for or against that topic will come up with claims that have been made, evidence behind those claims, 
and try to put together a cohesive argument and use many examples and even many kinds of emotional techniques to convince somebody that this is true, their position is true. So you can appreciate that this is way beyond answering questions. It is about arguing persuasively. So we wanted to see how far a computer could go in this direction. So we took Wikipedia, which now has about 5 million, four when we started this, but now it has about 5 million articles. And we tested whether we could build a system, and this has been going on multiple years now, we tested whether a system could whittle that down to about 10 relevant statements about any given topic, which could be controversial. That means that the computer has to um, first understand you know, the overall areas for each article, each of the articles, and that's a very large number of statements, and then identify the claims. And for each claim, identify the evidence, and, and try to put all of that stuff together in a manner that's understandable, using definitions, using claims, using uh, you know, expert opinions, using research that has been done in this area. So very, very complicated and a very sophisticated task that many of us you know, continue to learn throughout our lives, right? But we were able to test that. We've made a lot of progress, I should say. And I want to give you a glimpse of how far we've come. And I'm going to pick the domain of video games to demonstrate to you how far we've come in this area. By far, this is not yet a solved problem, but I want to show you where we're headed. Hello, and welcome to the IBM Debating Technologies demonstration. Today we shall focus on detecting relevant claims. To proceed, please select a topic, and I will share with you my top predictions for pro claims and con claims. Scanned approximately 4 million Wikipedia articles. Returning 10 most relevant articles. Scanned all 3,000 sentences in top 10 articles detected sentences which contain candidate claims, identified borders of candidate claims, assessed pro and con polarity of candidate claims, constructed demo speech with top claim predictions, ready to deliver. You have selected the topic, the sale of violent video games to minors should be banned. I would like to raise the following points in support of the topic. Exposure to violent video games results in increased physiological arousal aggression-related thoughts and feelings as well as decreased prosocial behavior. In addition, these violent games or lyrics actually cause adolescents to commit acts of real-life aggression. Finally, violent video games can increase children's aggression. On the other hand, I would like to note the following claims that oppose the topic. Violence in video games is not causally linked with aggressive tendencies. In addition, most children who play violent games do not have problems. Finally, video game play is part of an adolescent boy's normal social setting. Would you like to discuss another topic? Um, you can see, thank you. You can see how if you're a researcher in any field, you could be a financial researcher, a legal researcher, a scientific researcher, if you had a tool like this that could go through a vast corpus of um, articles and give you the most relevant articles for a hypothesis you have in mind or an experiment you have in mind, that would be tremendously helpful. I want to go to the next example. In this example, I'm going to show you how Watson can support a medical professional. And one of the easiest way areas to understand, there's many applications in medicine um, that can help oncologists and physicians of different uh, fields, cardiologists and so forth, but I'm gonna pick the field of um, you know, radiology for breast cancer. That's the field that I've picked here. And in this case, the cognitive system here has to understand images such as um, X-rays and MRIs and you know, other, other areas. And it has to correlate that information with what has been 
understood in the literature or in the general textbook knowledge of that field, and also correlate that back to the longitudinal data, which is all of the lab test results and the symptoms uh, and the treatments that a patient has gone through over a lengthy, potentially lengthy period of time. And combining the images with the unstructured writing and reports that are available in the longitudinal patient data, and the also unstructured, but maybe a little bit more curated kind of knowledge that's available in textbooks and in reports, that's a pretty complicated task for even humans. But a machine now is able to get to a degree of proficiency in doing this that it can actually be an assistant to a radiologist because radiologists need a lot of help. You know, they get tired because they've watched thousands of images throughout an entire day. And there's lots of errors that happen because of either, you know, tiredom or it could be because there's a new knowledge in the field that is not available to the radiologist at the point at which they're, they're analyzing images, images. And when we take this kind of technology to the radiology uh, community, they love to use this as an assistant. So again, this is another research area. It's not fully done yet, but I can show you how much progress we've made. And hopefully that'll tell you how this can actually make an impact in, um, you know, in everybody's health. Ultrasonic image has arrived. Tumor detection. Tumor has been found. Proceed to tumor characterization. Shape detection. Oval. Mass margin. Well-defined border. Circumscribed mass. Orientation of mass. Parallel to skin. Lesion boundary. Echogenic halo. Echo pattern. Anechoic. Posterior acoustic features. Posterior enhancement. Mears parameters. Virads 2. Anechoic. Homogeneous. Get clinical input from the patient files. High fever. Mastodynia. Tender left breast lump. Combined recommendation. Differential diagnosis. Either simple cyst or galactoseal. Patient management. Favor course of antibiotics over fine needle aspiration or incision and drainage. End of case processing. Thank you. So, thank you again. Um, this is not intended as a standalone radiologist, but it's intended as an assistant to a radiologist who looks at these options and these analyses and takes into account many other factors that are not available to the machine. For example, somebody's social circle and their habits and their past history, which may not be recorded. And there's many other angles where doctors have to use additional information from the context of the patient uh, condition as well as the history that they need to make decisions on. But maybe this cognitive assistant, the computer, can provide some options that the doctor had not originally considered, and that might make a big difference. So that's the direction that we're headed in, not just in this field, but in multiple other um, medical areas as well through a new business that IBM has started called Watson Health. Let me show you two more examples, and, and, uh, and that should give you up the breadth here. So the next example you should find particularly interesting for, you know, from, from, an, uh, from an art and design perspective. So imagine that Watson is available to you in a space. You could be in a studio if you're a designer, um, you could be in a classroom as a student. Um, as, as a business professional, I can imagine being in a boardroom. And in a boardroom, there's a lot of very complex decisions that are made. Um, for example, 
if a company like IBM wants to acquire a startup or another company, uh, there's a lot of factors that need to be taken into account. So what we've done is to test this idea of how Watson can help a collaborative decision-making process, we've constructed a cognitive environment in which people, multiple people, can go in and ask questions, interact naturally with each other and with a system. What this is showing is a number of different kinds of agents. We call them COGS. And these COGS, or agents, are available in this environment to support the people-to-people -people interaction that is trying to arrive at a, a pretty sophisticated, let's say, um, goal. So um, I want to, you know, instead of just giving you the, the theory of it, I want to show you how this can be implemented in practice through a video. Watson, show me companies with revenue between $25 million and $60 million pertaining to analytics. Let's see what I can find. I found 87 companies. Nice. Okay. So that's a good start. What that's do you think, Brian? But I was doing some homework, actually. I think we should pull on that Watson Strategy Group document. There's a lot of key concepts in there. Let's feed it to Watson. All right. Watson, please regard this as cognitive strategy. Watson, show me companies with revenue between $15 million and $60 million pertaining to cognitive strategy. Let's see what I can find. Yeah, this is nice. I found 112 hmm. companies. Now we're getting a lot in here. And we can see we're, we're getting some connections too, I think. Watson, show me companies that are about analytics and cognitive strategy that are most similar to the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics. I found three companies huh? similar to the oh. ones you specified. Beautiful. Well, let's see what we think of these. Dive a little deeper. Let's compare these things. Sure. Watson, show me a decision table. Here is a decision table that will enable you to compare companies side by side. Okay, but I think we need a little more than that. We need some uh, other attributes. Watson, place the attributes named revenue and employees and corporate structure in the decision table. Okay. All right, so now uh, we've got this side-by-side -side comparison. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's right. Watson, give me a suggestion. I have a suggestion. Yeah, that's when um, it started getting a little more confidential, so <laughs> I had to stop it there. But uh, you, can, you can imagine how in a, in a, in a corporate environment, uh, many different kinds of uh, complicated decisions can be uh, supported by Watson being in the wall, so to speak, understanding how people are asking questions, what kinds of hypotheses they're going after, what kinds of uh, um, new data that may be relevant to the conversation can be brought in at the right time and so forth. Um, my last example of the day today is in the area of robotics. Um, imagine, you know, Watson, which is right now in the cloud, being embodied within physical objects. It could be a robot, it could be a space, like I just showed, it could be an object, it could be some kind of a, you know, it could be a car, it could be a vehicle, for example. All of these are examples that um, you've all seen in the press, and um, you know, there's lots of experiments going on in the world right now where people are trying new kinds of tasks that can be done by robots. The experiment that we did in my research group, and it's going to be um, commercially available uh, in the near future, is with a company um, called SoftBank in Japan. And so one of the first things we needed to do was to teach Watson Japanese uh, so that uh, the robot can actually interact with people in Japanese. Uh, but more importantly than that, there is a lot of conversational elements that needs to be um, understood in, in the interaction between robots and people. So I want to show you a scenario in a store where a robot is helping somebody find what they're looking for. Yes, 
晶のちょっと古いやつ液晶ですね大きさはどれぐらいですか四十三インチくらいかなはい、買い替えならワンサイズ大きいのがおすすめですそうだね、なるほど五十インチだと画面が大きくなりますから四 k で美しい映像を見れるテレビをおすすめしますよ四 k はどこがいいのはい、お調べしますねデータベース検索中現在見られている放送を 4K 放送にアップコンバートしてくれる機能もありますので 4K 以外の放送も高画質で楽しめますテレビ入力に切り替えますねえいしばらくお待ちください調べしますねデータベース検索中データベース検索中現在スカパープレミアムにて 4K 総合と 4K 映画が放送を開始しています今後もその他のコンテンツで放送予定が計画されているそうですこのテレビの他の特徴を教えてくれるこのテレビには特にお伝えしたい特徴が2つあるよ1つ目は照明や外光などの映り込みを抑えた低反射液晶パネルを使用2つ目は色彩原範囲を拡大する技術を使って自然で豊かな発色を実現そうなんだ買い時かもね買い時ですそう、ありがとうございます This is just the beginning, by the way, of,、um, of this human computer interaction. And I think there's lots of issues with respect to design of the interactions as well as the, the systems themselves that are still open areas of discussion. And I want to end with a couple of points.、Uh, one point I want to make is that we're just at the beginning of this journey of cognitive computing. And the way I would explain that to you is to use a,、um, a simple graph that I put together. This is not a scientific graph, it's just my opinion. And I have on the x axis, I have what I think of as economic and social value. On the y axis, I think about the complexity or the effort required to build these kinds of systems. And the blue line kind of represents where we are. And this is a log scale. A log scale means it's exponentially. You know, growing in terms of the amount of time between any two points, which means that at the top of this list is really infinity. We don't know how to do it or when that's going to happen. And just to give you a sense of it, you know, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of AI researchers working on something called RoboCup, which is a bunch of robots that are going to play in the World Cup soccer finals. And that's in the middle, it's called RoboCup. And that's They think they can, they can achieve something like that in 2050. That's 35 years from now. That's halfway down the chart, which means you know, every little you know,、uh, increment that you go on top is going to double the amount of time, which means as you get to the top of the chart, it's forever.、Right? There's lots of areas that we've already achieved. And you see many of the things that we've talked about today down below over here. And some of them you are already very, very familiar with. Like an autopilot in a plane, or in, you know, a trading agent if you're, if you're buying and selling stocks and so forth. And this, of course, Jeopardy Watson, which we've now applied in many other areas that you heard about today. But if you want to make progress, we can do a lot of other things. I show here radiologist, the argumentation example that I showed you. I also show question answers with videos and so forth. The research community is working on all of these problems as we speak. And in the next few years, there's going to be a number of breakthroughs. And if you ask me what kinds of breakthroughs, I would say three major ones in my mind are in the area of machine learning, broadly speaking. I think we need to combine a number of techniques that were available in the past into a more holistic view that can, that can do a lot more than what we were able to do in the past. You know, systems that require optimization and collaborative cognition, which is like the example I showed earlier. How multiple people can work together to do something collaboratively 
and how machines can help them achieve their objectives. So there's a number of things that, that, that we can do over there. But before I end the talk, I want to, this is an area that is very exciting. And in my mind, this is an area that is going to make our lives much better and the world a much better place because we will not be able to solve the problems without these technologies that we are overwhelmed with, like the environmental problems, the health problems, education problems, like I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. In order to solve those really complex global scale problems, we do need these technologies. And we do need these as professionals who are inundated with data and knowledge in every area to get better in our jobs, in our lives, in our decisions that we make every single day. So I look at this as not machines or um, cognitive systems taking over, whether it's our jobs or it's you know, any other aspect of our lives. I look at this as augmenting, machines augmenting what we already do, the intelligence of humans that we can apply for creative problem solving by asking the right questions by applying the right kinds of value judgments, by using common sense, by doing all the creative tasks that we can do naturally, and use machines for those tasks for which machines are much better suited, such as going through huge amounts of data, such as doing all of the complex mathematical formulations, such as doing reasoning that can take, you know, 100 steps. You know, human reasoning, you can go three, four, five, six steps, and then you, you, know, you get tired but machines can go on for a much longer time and think through what can happen as consequences. So use machines when it's appropriate in every task that you can possibly do in your daily lives. And as a result of that, I believe we can be much more effective in what we do, and I think we can actually make the world a much better place. So thank you very much for this opportunity.